I found out about Merton Priory because I used to walk through the underpass to Merton Abbey Mills. I could see that there was something there, but um, I couldn't see very much. I knew this place existed, but because it's all shut off, it's, I've never actually been underneath it. I remember years ago when there was, the windows were open, I've looked in, and I kind of knew it was something to do with English history. I did find the whole blocked up window to be rather quite mysterious. If you're driving along the road, you wouldn't think like there's sort of uh, history underneath your feet like this. Something that's so significant is kind of buried under this road. It wasn't until one of the open house weekends a few years ago that I actually went into the Merton Priory and saw how large it was. It's quite a revelation. It's like an archaeological site under basically a road. So uh, completely shocking in, in a way, yes. You know, if this is such an important site and you look up there and there's KFC and Pizza Hut, what does it say about Britain? It'd be nice for future generations to be able to see places like this. We're in a sort of place that no one knows about. Even um, local people who walk past the door every day still don't know we're here. At the moment it's more of a temporary museum. Open usually about four or five times a year. The difficulty is, of course, that it's just foundations. And I think an awful lot of people who come here just don't know how big it was and how important it was and the enormous church that stood next to it. I mean, it was 300 feet long, which is the size of Westminster Abbey. The Merton Priory uh, Chapter House is quite different, I suppose, quite exceptional. It's a very unusual space and a very challenging project. This site has had a very checkered history. Henry VIII started the war railing by knocking it down altogether and taking all the materials to Nunsuch to build his palace there. Some archaeology took place in the early 20th century, but the site had been systematically trashed and went on being trashed through the 20th century. There's a pylon next door and, of course, a road over the top of us and loads and loads of flats and industry and fast food restaurants culminating in the Sainsbury's supermarket. But we have at least that to thank for the archaeology which has rediscovered the site. I was here in March 1987 when we excavated the main church next door and part of those excavations were the preservation of the chapter house in a way. My grandfather said that he was going to volunteer on the, um, the dig at the Priory on Sunday mornings and would I like to go along with him. We were told we only had access to the site for so long because then Sainsbury's needed to, to begin works there. But it was a period of, oh, I don't know, maybe six months. Most of the finds from the excavation are in store at the Museum of London. You know, this includes something like 740 skeletons and all the pottery, animal bones, Obviously, priories have an awful lot of bodies underneath them. I think I have some memory of different coffins. So most of it was excavating skeletons of the presumably the monks that had been buried under the priory. One Sunday, we actually had a couple of priests there, and they said, oh, they've been sent by the Catholic Church because we are effectively exhuming these bodies, so they've come to bless them. So there was a ceremony conducted where they gave their approval for the dig to continue. I was absolutely thrilled when Sainsbury's had finished the excavation to be presented with the key to this place. Now, so there's no money, just do what you like with it. So we started doing all sorts of things, art exhibitions, music, religious services, Shakespeare, all on a shoestring, very, very Spartan. There are no loos here, it's very cold. Many, many historical dramas also which were connected with Merton Priory. For example, Thomas Beckett was educated here and we did the Beckett play. Really, it's Merson's oldest building. You know, it's internationally important as a site. It's actually the first law in the English statute book called the Statute of Merton, named after this place. And it was signed by Henry III in this room. So you can see that it is really at the very centre of very historic London. Right next to me to the right is uh, William Morris's work. So we've got Morris and Co. who were here from 1881 to 1940. So we've got a double link there for people to learn about Morris and Merton. We have Liberty's works, we have Morton Hall Park, we have the River Wandle, the extraordinary industrial history of the Wandle, and this is right in the centre of it, and I think it deserves to become uh, a major public attraction. It's a um, site good for anyone, really, all ages, but certainly the children love it, because they have the archaeology for the kids and drawings and paintings, and the parents drop them off while they go shopping. 
And it wasn't till about 11 years ago when we had the Wandle Valley Festival, and that's how I really got going with the displays in the chapter house. And at that time, a lot of the stonework you see, like the coffins and the pieces of column, were scattered around the floor. So it's quite a challenge to actually get them on display to show them to the public. There was a stage right behind me. There was a stage for the theatre, and that became our display stands for the stone. They're a bit tatty now, but everything you see around here is all recycled. Because a lot of the archaeology was reburied when the, the structure above our heads was constructed, it's a voyage of rediscovery of what was found previous. We're still removing sand deposits which were put in place in the 1980s. One part of that removal of sand is actually see the conditions of the walls to see if they need repairing for the new phase of work. Phase one really is concentrating on access, making it much more widely known about, appreciated for what it is and for what it was. So the first thing we're going to do is knock down the whole of the south wall. That comes down and is replaced with a glass wall, showing the proper route around a much more organised museum. Having natural light sort of cast shadows over the archaeology and really bringing that texture alive is something that we're really driving towards. The history of London is literally under your feet in layers and I suppose that will bring that to life for people about how the land has changed use over hundreds of years. It's very, very hard to explain what was actually here and I thought of doing models and all kinds of things. But now we have at our disposal the perfect solution, which is computers. On a computer, you can build your own priory out of the foundations. So we really want really nice interactive equipment down here, really to teach particularly children this extraordinarily rich uh, heritage. It's quite a challenge to do it in, in this space. Everything that you see here really is under different ownership and we've got various channels of sign-off before we can actually build anything or indeed start digging a hole. We can't have heating, for example, because it has to be ventilated, because it's under a road. It's not really a building at all. Everything that we're sort of standing on the whole site is a scheduled ancient monument, so we've got to speak to Heritage England. We've also got to worry about TfL on the road bridge. It was the question really of trying to erect something underneath the road without actually touching the road. I don't know whether you ever lived in a house where you own the floor but somebody else owns the ceiling. That's perfectly true here. We're employed by the London Borough of Merton who own the land that we're stood on but we're also having to please the trust. Uh, the Merton Priory Chapter has trust. For the building of the new glass walls we had to see what survives under the ground and how the new glass wall would avoid the archaeology. All the way from the beginning, we had to put down all of the sort of risks that we could foresee. One of them was the environmental performance. There's no damp-proof course in these foundations, and it's very near the water table. We've done a fair amount of work to consolidate the masonry, loose flints particularly, which have come loose over the years. So we're aiming with phase one to open this out and make people aware of what's here. And when further building is done, audience, facilities and things like that, lighting, then that will enable us to become a proper social venue. As I have in mind things like medieval banquets, plays, of course, music. I'm really looking forward to hearing the wedding march down here. <laughs> I think it would be quite interesting to go there and actually to take my children as well and sort of tell them that that was something that not only I was involved in, but my grandparents, their great-grandparents that they don't remember. It's going to be a 10-year job, this, and it's already been a 20-year job as far as I'm concerned. Maybe it's going to be 30 years between the excavation of the site and the completion of it as a proper community resource. So that'd be good for the public to actually learn a lot more about it. So we've got Liberties and the Water Mill, Abbey Mills, and the history of the Wandle, Merton, and Morris. We've got over a thousand years of education here, all waiting to happen. I think accessibility is very important. Rather than being open two days in a year, if it would be possible for people to go and see you often, even at the weekend, that would be great. No, I'm just waiting for phase two. When it's completed, how it will look, and I would like to see more history. That's very good for the future.
I like the fact that there's a project underway to bring more light in and to kind of have more pride in the place. You'll be able to revive the history of this area because now we're surrounded by all these concrete new buildings but I think much more importantly is for people to realise how interesting this area had been you know, for centuries really.